looking at Daniel chapter 4 and in verse 17. To the intent that the living may know. Uh, this is quite a statement. That the living may know. Um, that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. And giveth it to whomsoever he will, and sitteth up over it, and setteth up over it the basest of men. Not a real compliment to Nebuchadnezzar here. But now, notice, if you will, I want also to, to bring out these words. Look in verse 24. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord. Um, all good. Um, and now, if you'll notice, in, uh, in Daniel chapter 4 and in verse 25, Daniel chapter 4 and in verse 25, uh, the last end of verse 25, it says, And seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Uh, now down in verse 32. Well, hi, Kathy. <laughs> How are you, dear? Verse I'm good. Good. Verse 32, so very glad to have you with us. Look at the last half of verse 32. Until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Verse 33 of, of Daniel 4. The same hour was the thing, that's our other word we want to watch here, fulfilled. Interpretation and fulfillment. Very important words in this chapter. And we need to understand the sovereignty of God uh, and how he is working out what is going on for his kingdom purpose. Um, and you say, well, I, I don't understand this present president and I hear all of this, and I don't like some things either. I'll, I'll join in sometime. Uh, I know, we realize that. We realize that. But remember who raiseth them up and bringeth them down. Remember in the book of Romans, chapter 9. Maybe we ought to turn there. Turn to the book of Romans for just a moment. Romans, chapter 9. Book of Romans, chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, and let's look in verse 16. Romans chapter 9, verse 16. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. Who raised him up? God raised Pharaoh up, and who hardened his heart? <coughs> well, most of the time, God did, but, you know, Pharaoh took it upon himself a few times. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have raised thee up that I might show my power in thee, and that my, my name <coughs> might be declared throughout all the earth. So we may not be happy with what Pharaoh was doing with Israel, but God raised him up. Okay? So we have to see, we have to back up and understand that the counsel of God, his eternal scheme, is being worked out in all these things. Um, and I think that, uh, that that might help us to appreciate uh, what we've been looking at. Now, what does it mean, the most high God? Well, in this uh, particular case, and also where we first see it in the book of Genesis chapter 14, I believe we touched on that the last time we were together, is when Abram came from the slaughter of the kings of Sodom, rescuing um, uh, his nephew, which, by the way, wasn't even supposed to be going with him. You remember, God said to leave the family, and he somehow he's brought um, Lot with him. And you remember, Lot ended up in all kinds of trouble, didn't he? 
later on the, the Lot's cattle, cattlemen, and Abram's cattlemen couldn't get along. And Lot, uh, he says, well, here's the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's see, well-watered plains plus cattle equals money. <laughs> and he ended, up, uh, he ended up in high places in Sodom and Gomorrah, didn't he? Mm -hmm. uh, he ended up being the governor of that plain and sold out his kids to immorality, Right? And uh, God had, and if it wasn't for Abraham and his intercession, that's a good uh, passage on, if you want to understand how to intercede for somebody, mm -hmm. that's a pretty good passage. He had a wife that became a statue. Yeah, pillar of salt. Um, you know that old joke, the guy, the old preacher that put the, the, um, the, um, the little notice above his clock in the back of his church. Do you, do you remember that joke? You know how people kind of look when maybe the preacher's going over a little bit, kind of look back like that, <laughs> right? And uh, the preacher put up a note over the, the clock says, remember Lot's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look back. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we have all these all of these devices and watches and, I don't know, watches that check your blood pressure and tell you whether you're going to die in five minutes or not or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, that's an old joke. Okay. Uh, don't look back. <laughs> All right. So when we're when we're considering here in the book of Genesis, the first time it's used. This is the first time it's used, and and it's interest. A lot of things are ironic here. Um, who's it used with? Abram, father of a nation, who's later named father of many nations, right? Um, we also see on the scene. Melchizedek, um, and if you look in verse 18, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the most high God. So we have this, um, we have this hierarchy, a spiritual hierarchy of God given to us here. And remember that when we come to the book of Hebrews, this is, designated, defined, and described for us, um, and that Jesus Christ is of the order of Melchizedek. No beginning of days, no ending of days. King of Salem, king of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And he is our, the churches, he's our great high priest, the one who intercedes for us. Now, verse 19, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, um, this idea of most high God, um, it goes, it's quite extensive in the sense of its scope. Um, it's El Elyon, meaning simply highest. God is the high, God the highest. And the, this uh, name indicates its distinctive meanings and, uh, and, uh, and introduced to us is the priest of the Most High God who blesses Abram in the name of El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth. And not only did he once give Melchizedek tithes of all, the spoil of battle, and when the king of Sodom offered spoil to Abraham, he refuses it. If you'll notice in verse 20, uh, verse 22, and Abraham said to the king of Sodom, and, so, I'm sorry, Sodom, I've lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, and I will not take from, from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should stay, I've made Abram rich. Uh, Abram wanted everybody to know it's the most high God that's done this. The possessor of heaven and earth. Now, um, the, this idea uh, has to do, um, and, and uh, we want to make sure that we understand what that means, uh, it, is that most high God has and exercises authority 
in both the heavenly and earthly sphere. He exercises authority. So this is a long sovereignty. And we as believers, now imagine, if you will please, so let's go back to where to our primary application. We have, we have uh, Daniel interpreting this dream. Thou art the tree. And here's what's going to happen to you, right? And I want you to notice how that Daniel introduces the Most High God to Nebuchadnezzar. And also how the Most High God introduces himself to Nebuchadnezzar himself. <laughs> okay. And I want you to understand that um, Daniel doesn't, he doesn't sugarcoat this at all. And that's what's important about interpretation. Okay. I want to emphasize interpretation. Um, it is not the responsibility of us to give the meaning. The meaning is already there. It's our response, of, and this is where we get the word hermeneutics from, is from the word interpretation, hermeneo. Uh, and that word has to do with, uh, it specifically, to loose, to solve, to explain. Uh, a solution or an explanation. And that's what Daniel's doing. God has a message directly to Nebuchadnezzar. And this thing is going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. And within the chapter, after Nebuchadnezzar's told, what does he do? Well, he walks out among those hanging gardens and he takes credit for his greatness and for the greatness of his kingdom and then he's out eating grass with the animals for seven years. Mm -hmm. Oops. Even after he was told, even after he acknowledged what, Dan, or what Daniel had told him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think it's important to also list this um, idea of interpretation. We're going to get to that in a minute. Then we find toward the end of the chapter the word fulfillment. How often do you read the New Testament and this was done for what reason? To fulfill the scriptures. The completeness of what God has said is paramount to the word. Now we've gotten away from that now. Uh, churches have become entertainment uh, they've become institutions of denominational rule, and we have lost um, the idea of the Word of God being God's final authority. He's going to complete everything He's given, it will be fulfilled. Um, and it's, it, this is the final court of appeals, right here. When all things were said and done, do you think Nebuchadnezzar was saved? I don't know. Well, I look at... I, it's hard to say. I look at 37, verse 37. Uh-huh. And it appears that he may have been saved. I mean, well, I thought... The fact that... I thought the... I thought the... Off. The fiery furnace would have done it, but... <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but, but we have, you know... An, after he's told uh, about the image, he turns around and builds one. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of wonder. Now, understand, though, the mind of the Chaldean. And understand how these guys work. Now, let me give you an example. Later on, we're going to learn about Cyrus. And here's Cyrus. And by the way, Cyrus was a, was a really weird character. But Cyrus decides one day, well, you know what? If we let these people worship the way they want to, we'll be able to get along with them better. So let's send Ezra back over there and uh, let them build Jerusalem again. And um, let these people worship the way they want to worship, and we won't have so much trouble. Now, God used that 
of course. God used it. And it was done at the end of the 70 years that God said he would protect. Yeah, it's all according to God's plan. Um, and God can move in these kings. And he can move in kingdoms. Now, I should number my stories, and we'll have to give this one a number. I've told you this story many times. The first time we went over to Swaziland and we went into the hills, and you remember that, right? Mm -hmm. And we were, we were ministering to the king's aunt all week, and I didn't know it. And we came to Sunday, and here they came in their BMWs with their... Um, traditional dress shield spears. I really did think we was done for. <laughs> and uh, took us out and left us. And what did we have? The king says, you're going to build a church here. Well, he's no more saved than that tree out there. I can tell you that. <laughs> Not the most moral man you'd ever want to meet. But God can work in these kings. He can work in the kingdoms of men. Uh, these things that are happening can bring about God's sovereign will in his way. See? Um, so in, in chapter 4, and, and the, what's being pointed out to us is verse what? Verse 37, well, Leona? 34, 34 and 37. It looks like Nebuchadnezzar had a change of heart I don't see being turned over. Understand yeah. that. And he's saying, uh, I bless, in the turning, I bless the most high. Uh -huh. Making me think that he was seeing God now as something different and that he wanted to honor him. I'll give you all of that. In 37. But remember, these are idolatrous worshipers. Mm hmm so he may have praised and extolled and honored the king of heaven and then turned right around and worshiped an idol or something. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh -huh. And when you get into the book of Acts, remember how they wanted to do sacrifice unto Paul and, um, and Barnabas. And they were calling uh, Paul and Barnabas Mercury and Jupiter. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and Paul said, no. No, we're like men of like passion, same as you. And then they turned around and wanted to kill him. Mm -hmm. Right? And le almost and left Paul for dead. Mm -hmm. um, understand idolatrous worship. Um, yeah, today they'll do that today, then turn around and make an image and have everybody worship next time. So it may be one of those kind of things when we get to heaven, we'll see that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, there it is. <laughs> it could be. Uh, it could be. You have Darius later on with uh, Daniel. We're going to come up on that. Darius and um, Daniel, thou servant of the, uh, of the living God. And he extols the God of, of uh, Daniel, right? Um, but was he saved? Well, I don't see. Um, I, I see uh, worship being offered as a result of these circumstances, right? I don't see anything about personal salvation. Um, and that can happen. Well, you, you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Did they not believe in God? Did he is one God? Did, uh, and all about the Old Testament, they knew all about that, but, when, but yet they crucified Jesus Christ. And the book of 1 Corinthians said, if they knew that he was the Lord of glory, they would not have crucified him. Well, it's just like your dad used to say, he go to funerals, and the loved ones would say, do you think he was saved? And all your dad could say was, I don't know, only God has a snack diet. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and he was always very careful to be honest in those situations. Mm -hmm. uh, paramount to do that. Uh, I just had a situation like that. I believe this man that passed was not saved. And... Um, uh, I had no evidence of it. And under emotional circumstance, they want to make them all saved, you know. Yeah. Um, well, we don't save. God saves. And that's my line. It's God that saves. We don't save anybody. Um, and that's, that's, uh, that's between the heart and the Savior. That's not for us to say. Um, 
yeah, you have that, uh, and you have that acknowledgement. Uh, it's interesting to me, we, we have a state of emergency uh, that the Senate of the United States, well, let's pray. And you know, a good share of those good old boys aren't real moral most of the rest of the time. <laughs> Fire water, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so... Um, and it's time, I'll give it this label. If you can't beat them, join them. Right? Um, and I, I think we have a little bit of that with Daniel. My problem is, too, that after, when Nebuchadnezzar's told, he still goes out and tries to take credit for the greatness of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't belong to him. Yes. Um, that's my problem with it. It's not, it's not real consistent, is it? Um, but anyhow, all right, I don't know how we... Changes the mind a lot. We have to... Uh, well, and I haven't... That he was eating for a while. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't brought out... Like oxen. Yeah, and I haven't been fair to you because I haven't brought out all of the background of the Chaldeans yet. Uh, they had a lot of gods, just like uh, Pharaoh... Uh, they worshipped everything, frogs, the Nile, and you remember God plagued all of those things to show that he is Lord and God, and um, when it came time for Pharaoh to humble himself, instead he tries to wipe out Israel, <laughs> and he brings those chariots, and we have the Red Sea incident, and God makes it pretty clear who is Lord of Lord and King of Kings and who is running the show, and it's God. Um, but anyhow, the, the, it's important for us to, um, this morning to appreciate what this means and then the application to us. And here is what's required. We must, regardless of the circumstances, um, we must acknowledge God is sovereign even if the circumstances are not proving that to our satisfaction. Uh, here you have Daniel. He is um, no fault of his own. He is captive and brought to Babylon. What Daniel do wrong? Nothing. Uh, what did his uh, three uh, colleagues do wrong? Nothing. But God brought them, and they're, they are standing in the court of the king. See? And they're standing in the court of the king, but they're standing for God. And ironically, they are, they are perpetrating and, 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 and um, prop, uh, prop um, uh, I wanted to say propaganda, but that's not what I wanted to say. Um, they are propagating a witness for God. And the nation didn't get that done. The nation went apostate. The nation became like, the, uh, the nation of Israel became like the nations. They became a mission field instead of being God's witness. But God's purpose is still going to get done. <laughs> See? And it gets done through this relationship of Daniel to these kings. Now, what I'm trying to accentuate to you this, 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 this afternoon that even in this position, God's purpose can be accomplished through those that are faithful to God and faithful to his word. Mm -hmm. Of all the places, uh, where's Daniel standing? In the court of the king. Mm -hmm. God put him there. And he put him there for these purposes, for these incidents that come up. You see what I mean? Um, there's nothing by chance here. There's nothing by chance. This is all God's sovereign design. Uh, that's what we have to appreciate. And we have to, in order to understand that, we have to understand that our God is a possessor of heaven and earth. He marshals 
from a superior position all things heaven and earth. Okay? Um, now, do we always understand everything? I'm sure that Daniel wrestled with a lot of these things, <laughs> having to give these interpretations to these kings, and, and he's saying a lot of things that is not what these kings wanted to hear. Right? You're the tree, Nebuchadnezzar, and you're going down, and you're going down hard. Mm -hmm. Right? And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. Right? Um, and my point for us as believers, what's the point? We have to appreciate the fact that our God is the most high God. He is working in the kingdoms of men, even those that are corrupt, even in anarchy, even under this situation where Jerusalem is burned down and they've been, um, they've been deported and put in this place, last place they'd want to be. Right? Uh, but God has them there to fulfill his purpose. Um, look in the book of, um, um, oh, let's look in Isaiah 14 a minute, for a minute. The book of Isaiah, just go back a couple books from uh, Daniel. Isaiah chapter, chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. It is important for us to have a sharp understanding of, of what God's put us here to do. Isaiah chapter 14, and let's look in verses 13 and 14. Isaiah, uh, oh, let's back up to verse 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Who is this? It's Satan. How art thou cut down to the ground who didst weaken the what? Nations. That, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also in the mount of the congregation and the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to Sheol to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man who made the earth to tremble, who did shake the nations, who made the world like a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who opened not the house of the prisoners? Um, yet God is in control of it all. God is in the control of it all. Uh, here, uh, Satan, I will be like who? The Most High. Look in Matthew 28, 18. The book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, 18. I wish I had the time. I don't have it. To bring all three point, these three points together. But I, I'm not going to be able to do it this morning. Matthew chapter 28. Um, and in verse 18. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, This is the 500 brethren, Galilee. This is the church. This is representation of the church. All authority is given me where? In El Elyon. El Elyon. All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, what are we supposed to be doing? Well, I just get a job and I survive. No. No. That's not why you're here. I'm not telling you not to work your job. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not what I'm telling you. Uh, and by the way, you'll find out later that Daniel was the most excellent in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. I believe Christians ought to have the most excellent work record. They ought to be the best at it because they have the grace of God. God's with us. Uh, these, poor, uh, these poor unbelievers, I don't know how they're making it. It must be difficult to survive. <laughs> uh, we have the grace of God. What are we supposed to be doing right now in this earth? 
Oh, pastor, it's getting worse and worse. Oh, it's just terrible. I see Christians giving money to fight the government and try to put these other guys in, and they're just as shady and corrupt as the other guy. As soon as he gets in office, he goes right along with the program. Have you ever noticed that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Shazam, who knew? Well, no, 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 no. What we have to concentrate on is this. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations. Teach who? What is the one who says all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth? What does he want us to do? Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. What are you supposed to do? Ye are my what? Witnesses. Ye are my witnesses. That's what our life is here for. That's what El Elyon has told his church. Go ye into all the world and propagate my gospel. Teaching the nations. Now that's what Israel was supposed to do. And they apostatized from it. Now we have the age of the church. And guess what the church is doing? Everything but that. <laughs> right? Entertainment. Whatever it is they're doing. How much programming is missions? How much programming is teaching the word of God today? Uh, it looks like we're failing the same way Israel did. But there's always a remnant. God always has a remnant, right? We're told that in the book of Romans chapter 11. Uh, even in the days of Ahab and Jezebel, there was Elijah and there was the prophets of Obadiah. And you remember what God told, um, and you remember what God told uh, Elijah. Uh, not now, not interested. Let's see if I can get him back. Sorry. I swear I want to get us all off of here. Get us on Wi-Fi there. Okay. Um, and so um, what, what are we to be doing? Well, we're to be going out and we're to be teaching the nations. That's what, we, that's what we're here for. That's what the sent one said. As I was in the world, so send I what? You. As I was sent into the world, even so send I you. Um, and what do we have Christians doing today? Well, they're so busy in the things of the earth and in the world, they're not getting God's business done. Mm -hmm. See? But there is, um, there is, this, uh, there is uh, this remnant. And that's what we're seeing with Daniel. The remnant understands what? The Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men. That, don't tell me that's not the message of this chapter. <laughs> it is reiterated over and over again. Uh, now that word interpretation comes in, and that teaches us what? Explanation. Solution. According to what? God's word. Uh, oh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar, here's the interpretation of this dream from the possessor of of heaven and earth. And here's exactly what's going to happen. And it's going to happen to you. You are the tree. You're the tree. And um, uh, that interpretation is exactly God's word. Um, now look with me in the book of... i got to do this a little bit. or We'll never get there. Look in the book of Matthew for a minute. The book of Matthew, please. The book of Matthew, <coughs> no, I know I wrote that down. All right, I know it anyway. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. 
Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm, I am not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. Fulfill. Um, the king of the universe, the king of the everlasting kingdom, is subject to completing the word of God. What he has commanded me, that's what I say. What he has told me, that's what I do. Right? Uh, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot nor one tittle shall in no way pass from the law till it be what? Fulfilled. Fulfilled. Uh, look in the book of uh, uh, Second Peter. Second Peter. I got to put these words together so we see the whole picture. Second Peter, chapter one. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar is a great king and a great kingdom, and it was massive and it was huge and it was powerful. But the Most High ruleth in that kingdom because He has a purpose. And notice, if you will, in 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter 1, and in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private, what? Hermeneo. Solution, explanation. For the prophecy came not in any time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as... They were moved by the Holy Spirit. Uh, God is moving and he's working even in Babylon in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? All right, well, I, I, I had to make those connections between those words. Uh, how important the word of God is. Uh, the church would be a lot more effective if we would simply go back and preach the word and then propagate his gospel. (laughs) Get busy in God's business. Um, That's the salvation that's needed. It's not going to come through economics. It's not going to come through politics. It's not going to come through those avenues. It's going to have to come from the Most High God. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you this morning for who thou art. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for one another. And Father, may we be careful to understand that we are servants of the most high God. And it is he who raises up and brings down. And it's his sovereign purpose and intention that will be fulfilled. And these things we thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen.